So I want to thank uh, Patricia and also the National Academies for inviting uh, me to present at this, uh, this distinguished workshop. And uh, I'm here uh, to talk about an area in which we actually need higher drug prices, not lower. So that, that's a difficult talk to begin with, isn't it? And just to say from the beginning that I'm here giving my academic opinions from Boston University, not necessarily the position of CARBEX or any of the CARBEX funders. The problem is that uh, we lack access to the type of novel antibiotics that infectious disease doctors say we need, especially in the hospital setting and especially against gram-negative superbugs that are on the CDC and WHO uh, critical bacterial you know, priority pathogen lists. Uh, if you think about uh, new classes of antibiotics or, or think about every other class of drugs in, in the world, the, the best heart disease medicine is still going to be effective in a thousand years. The best, uh, you know, d d drug against depression, is, you know, doesn't decline in, in usefulness over time. For antibacterials, as soon as the drug is a perfect drug, an amazing drug is created, uh, it's undermined uh, by the evolution of bacteria in response to its utilization. Penicillin was a great drug. Right? And so we need constant innovation in this sector in order to keep even, to keep from falling behind. And how long has it been since we've had a new class of drugs against gram-negative, the, the worst type of superbugs, uh, that's a, a new class that's been discovered and made it all the way through FDA approval? It's actually been since 1962 that that discovery occurred. And uh, that's the year that I was born. So it's another way of saying in my entire lifetime, We've not had the discovery of a new class against gram negatives that's made it through FDA approval. Okay? And uh, as my children will tell you, that's a very long time. <laughs> These are some of the, uh, the responses to this problem, the fact that we have an inadequate number of new antibacterial drugs. It's a very busy slide. There's a lot of things going on. Uh, and you can see the NIH up here in uh, one part of the slide. Right here, $1.4 billion being spent from 2016 to 18 on basic research and SBIRs, et cetera, uh, and, uh, and many other you know, activities going on. CARBEX is a piece of that, but certainly not the only piece or even the largest piece. Uh, this is uh, CARBEX and our funders. I'm happy to say that uh, you know, three of the leading governments in the world, the United States, represented by Health and Human Services, specifically BARDA and, and NIAID, uh, the government of the United Kingdom, the government of Germany, and then two uh, premier foundations, the Wellcome Trust and Bill and Linda Gates Foundation, these are our funders. We have over a half million dollars deployed over the first five years. We're in year three, at the end of year three of our project at this point, uh, to invest in the preclinical and phase one uh, group of uh, products that would address antibacterial resistance. So trying to keep uh, close to the topic today, I'm going to talk about the basic research work with NIH, how that fits a little bit with CARBEX, uh, some things about specifically NIH's interface with CARBEX, and then finally about the stewardship and access rules. Uh, access, it's part of, uh, of what we're talking about today, but stewardship is the flip side, is the need to actually restrict and be careful with uh, new antibiotics so that we don't waste them. Uh, as well. So thinking about products and development, this is from Pew Charitable Trust, who uh, just recently this week on Monday added a, a beautiful animation to their website uh, that gives you a picture of what's happening in the antibiotic uh, uh, clinical drug development uh, field. And it's a grim picture. It's a fragile pipeline. Uh, there's, if you compare this to cancer, immune oncology has over a thousand products in clinical development today. And for antibacterials, 42, and only a small number of those actually targeting the the things that health experts say that we need to be targeting. And based on the historic averages, not many of these are going to make it all the way through uh, to actual approval. Uh, this is a busy slide. Uh, Aaron Kesselheim and I and a group of others uh, did this work in annals uh, a few years ago. But at the time, this was the, uh, the, the pipeline of antibacterials that had received FDA approval from 2010 to 14. Uh, the Infectious Disease Society of America had called for 10 new drugs by 2020, and you know they were well on the way, even halfway through the decade. But uh, two things to draw from this. First of all, I think it's fair to say that that the health impact of these drugs has has not been overwhelming. So you know we got new drugs, but not necessarily the drugs that the infectious disease doctors treating superbug uh, patients in the hospitals wanted. And the second thing to notice is just uh, how many times these products jump around between different uh, companies. You know, they get licensed, they get moved, uh, the products, the program stalls, somebody else picks it up. 
And also, how many of these are really small, small companies doing the work? Sometimes the larger companies come in near the end in order to do the commercialization phase. It's really small companies that are carrying the bulk. And by small, I mean under 100 employees in, in this slide, and even smaller when you get to the preclinical pipeline. Uh, this is a, a slide. It's, it's not been published yet, but it's based on work by Alan Carr. And uh, I, I've used this slide in, in many settings. But this takes every branded, every patented antibiotic, which has been uh, approved in the U.S. since 2009, and then plotted its monthly sales uh, across the, the, the x-axis there. And the red line indicates the amount of monthly sales a drug would need in the United States, an antibiotic would need, in order to break even, assuming that the R&D had been free. Okay, what an assumption. So it, only to keep the lights on in the plant and to keep the, the commercialization and regulatory process rolling, they have to hit that red line. And this isn't a cherry pick sample, this is all of them, okay? So all the drugs I showed on the previous slide, plus the ones that have been approved in the years since, uh, there's really only two that are breaking even on an on a incremental basis with R&D cost assumed to be zero, sunk, and one that's approaching it. There's another way of saying that these drugs are not selling well. Okay, and part of my hypothesis here, I think it's well founded, is that the problem in antibacterial drug discovery is not science, or science is excellent, it's economics. The prices are too low, or the value that the companies are reaping is too low. So this is the, the six public, uh, six, you know, the public companies involved in the space are shown at the bottom, Acajan, Intasis, Melinta, et cetera, Tetraface. And uh, I was able to calculate using uh, both public and private data the the amount that they had invested in the R&D collectively. Uh, and between these companies, there's, uh, there's six uh, publicly, uh, six FDA approved products in this list and several more that are in phase three. They invested collectively $2.5 billion, these six companies, and that does not include the cost of other companies that failed. It's just the sunk R&D cost for these six companies. And uh, their market cap uh, as of now is uh, under a, a half million dollars, a, a half billion dollars. So in other words, the successful companies in this field have been a, an amazing value destruction machine eating up $2 billion for the capital, uh, not even counting the companies that never made it to FDA approval. Okay? So the economics in this field are daunting. Uh, this is a unpublished work, uh, but it's coming out soon in Nature Reviews Microbiology. I'm a co-author in this piece. Uh, and it shows uh, you know, we looked at all the preclinical pipeline for the world using uh, the data that, uh, that various uh, groups on this, uh, on this paper have access to. And uh, there's a lot of things going on. Uh, there's uh, phages and, and microbiome type approaches, monoclonal antibodies, things that are traditional alternatives, uh, alternatives to traditional antibiotics in addition to small molecule uh, products. A lot of innovation. And uh, I, we haven't written the paper yet on tracing how many of these go back to the NIH but I'm telling you that the NIH looms extraordinarily large, and its analogs in other countries, uh, not only in the, the original patents, but also uh, you know, creating the technology which is spun out, and then a subsequent patent happens when the company spins out. And really, almost everybody in this field has some NIH uh, funding in their background, either when they were a PhD or a postdoc or, or, or subsequent to, to that. Uh, it blooms extraordinarily large, and, and we need to do that work as well. This also shows you the impact of uh, the decisions that were taken at NIAID uh, several years ago to focus this work on really new targets, new mechanisms of action, and new classes. In the preclinical pipeline of the world as of today, 72 percent of the projects are new classes, new mechanisms of action, or new molecular targets on bacteria. Uh, so it's a much more innovative group of projects than today's clinical uh, pipeline uh, in, the, in the world. All right. Second is to talk a little bit about CARBEX. And uh, NIAID, NIAID, uh, has two out of our, our board members. Uh, they also participate in many ways. But just to give you a little sense of where we sit, uh, for antibiotics, there's different ways to solve the problem. You can increase the, uh, you can decrease the demand for antibiotics, this would be like public health, infection control. The best drug-resistant infection is the one that never occurred, right? So, you know, let, let's do everything we can on the public health side. But also stewardship, being careful of the drugs so we don't drive resistance up. These are demand-lowering ideas. Then over in supply, you could create new ones. That's the CARBEX mission, create new 
uh, uh, you know, antibiotics and new treatments. You could also find older drugs that somehow you could restore or repurpose for antibacterial use. And in the middle, there are some techniques that really touch both. You know, vaccines uh, uh, and, and microbiome uh, have multiple areas. And the scope for CARBEX are the things in green. You know, new products, new vaccines, and new diagnostics as well. Okay. I've said we, we've in, we're investing a, more than a half million uh, through the first uh, five years. We're expecting uh, to be renewed out for, uh, to, for, the, for the next five as well. We funded 44 projects, $126 million has gone out uh, at this point. Uh, really that 15 number uh, should be in the, in the low 20s. We have a, a large number of projects for which our board, including NIAID, has approved uh, funding of the project and we're in negotiation over the budget and scope of work with the company. We're fully nonprofit, 100% non-dilutive. We're, we're here for the mission of, of, of health, protecting Americans and protecting people around the world. Uh, from these drug-resistant infection sort of activities. And this will give you a sense of, the, of some of our portfolio and uh, you know, where the company came into uh, our, our you know, working with Carbex and where they are as of today. Most of these companies have been with us for 18 months or less. Uh, so we are actually progressing products forward. And you can also see the little check mark on the end. Uh, a number of companies have graduated from Carbex. We, don't, we go only go to the end of the phase one human trials. And uh, there's other uh, you know, programs, especially within the U.S. government, from BARDA uh, to pick up funding at the phase two and phase three. BARDA is our, our largest funder and, uh, and the, has the largest representation on the board of Carbex as well, the JOC. So I want to talk also about uh, stewardship and, and access. And you know, stewardship was not part of this. Uh, this uh, you know topic, uh, larger topic for today, but for our group of drugs, uh, you do need to be careful not to overuse them, right? If we just uh, create new drugs and waste them the way we've wasted antibiotics for the prior uh, decades, we've actually not done much to solve uh, the problem. So this represents uh, some of the balance, and if you can believe it, uh, this one slide was really the topic of a two-day meeting in Geneva, a workshop with 150 people, it's really quite complex to get this balance right. If we prioritize just stewardship, we deny access and, and kill the innovation machine. If we just talk about innovation uh, and the prices are incredibly high, we've denied access to the people who need them and also undermine stewardship. All three of these things need to be simultaneously solved in order to have a, a realistic, long-term, sustainable solution in this area. And the way we do this at CARBEX is contractual. And to be clear here, uh, this part of the talk is, is not about anything the NIH has done, but this is a CARB-X contractual mechanism. You know, so that we, any company that we fund, uh, as part of their agreement to receive funds from CARB-X, uh, since we're, we're you know, a private organization with the trustees of Boston University, uh, they're, they're required to sign on to these, these requirements. And what they do is uh, that they, they agree to, perf to create a non-confidential stewardship and access plan uh, no later than their pivotal clinical trial, and it actually gets published on our website uh, around the time that they first have FDA or EMA approval, the first approval in a major market. And so uh, the co we give the company guidance on how to, uh, to create this uh, stewardship and access plan. But the primary enforcement mechanism, the primary is really just transparency. Uh, getting these plans out into the open, they include things like uh, you know the pricing and the, the licensing strategy and, and where in the world they plan to commercialize and what parts of the world they don't have immediate plans to commercialize, how they then plan to make it available if, if, it's, if it's useful uh, in other low and middle income settings, et cetera. It follows general norms from, uh, from the, as you can see, the industry roadmap and the WHO Global Action Plan is published on our website. It's updated on a regular basis. And these obligations follow the project IP, which is uh, you know, the things that are created uh, with CARBEX funding. Um, if, uh, if CARBEX goes away, if our grant ceases, the Wellcome Trust, our second largest funder, is the inheritor to these rights. Uh, we're pretty sure the Wellcome Trust will be around uh, to, uh, to continue to carry these things forward. And, uh, and they have to, uh, to cover um, you know, five basic elements, which I have on backup slides because uh, I didn't want to you know, overwhelm you with those. Uh, they're on the backup slides here today. But one important one is that uh, there's a, a contractual analog to the Baudol right uh, baked into our contract. Uh, it, it, and, the, and those rights rest not with the director of the NIH, uh, but with the director of Wellcome Trust. Uh, it's important for me to emphasize 
that uh, all of the relevant stakeholders, including the companies themselves and including their trade association bio, uh, have signed off on this program. Uh, mainly because it was so well understood that uh, for antibacterials you have to have stewardship. You can't just have uh, you know, willy-nilly marketing of these new powerful drugs. And you have to think about uh, how the access is going to be useful and, and available around the world. Failure to do that would mean failure in this category of, of drugs. And all the relevant stakeholders, the funders of Carbax, uh, the companies themselves, uh, and the industry writ large uh, have agreed that this is the correct way to proceed. Uh, the last thing I want to say is that uh, Carbex is, a, is an amazing uh, viewpoint into one particular silo of drug innovation, antibacterials. Uh, because of our relationship and the number of companies that apply to us and the number of companies that we fund, uh, we, we have a, an incredible view into everything, I think, going on in this one particular you know, vertical silo within drug development. And, uh, and we have the ability to, to, to do anonymized uh, academic work uh, based on that information. I'm also principal investigator uh, of this project. Uh, we, can, we will never do anything that uh, you know, releases information that's confidential to a certain company. But uh, for example, the preclinical uh, slides that I showed earlier that are coming out in Re Nature Reviews Microbiology in the near future are based on, in part, uh, this sort of information. And uh, where this uh, comes out, it's, it's not directly through Carbex, but uh, another program at Boston University that I lead called Social Innovation and Drug Resistance CIDR. And this is the portal for interested researchers who uh, would like to be tied in with uh, some of this data, have a look at it, and some people in the room uh, are already in these, this uh, sort of relationship with us. Uh, if you have interest, then contact me and we can see whether there's something we can do for you uh, through the CIDR program. And I, I have 15 seconds left, and I'm going to yield it back because I'm shocked I finished 10 seconds early. Thank you. <laughs>